Hi everyone, this is Christy Gressman. On behalf of the entire Orbiting Human Circus, I'd like to welcome you to Episode 8 and thank our sponsors, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans and Blue Apron. And I'd like to thank you for listening this season. This episode will be the narrative finale of Season 1, but stay tuned for one more special bonus episode to come in two weeks. That episode will tell the story behind the story of Season 1, and we'd like your help to make it. Send us your questions about the show or its characters or anything else to podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com, and we'll choose a few of them to answer in Episode 9. We'll be answering questions about things that won't necessarily be revealed later on. So again, let us know what you'd like to know at podcast at orbitinghumancircus.com. We'll also be announcing 2017 tour dates and some other exciting things to come at orbitinghumancircus.com as soon as we can. We're so grateful to Blue Apron, a recipe delivery service that helps you make your own incredible home-cooked meals at blueapron.com OHC. I don't know about you, but I love to open gifts. I mean, I love to give gifts too, but I also really like to open them. I've been getting Blue Apron meal kit deliveries for a few weeks now, and it's really like getting a fun new present every time. A delicious present that you can feel good about, because Blue Apron's meals contain fresh, high-quality ingredients sourced through partnerships with over 150 artisanal suppliers and family-run farms across the United States. Blue Apron supports a more sustainable food system by supporting things like regenerative farming practices. And they reduce food waste by delivering only what you need to make each recipe in recyclable packaging. Whether it's beautiful winter vegetables or small batch butter or locally farmed honey, with Blue Apron, you can give yourself a gift you'll love. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com OHC. That's OHC for Orbiting Human Circus. And thanks so much to Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for supporting our show this entire season. Check out Rocket Mortgage today for a transparent, trustworthy, and totally online home loan process by going to quickenloans.com slash OHC. And now, episode eight. hospital room in the heart of Paris. Here lies Julian, janitor at the Eiffel Tower, who opens his eyes. Come on, boy, you can do it. Who opens his eyes and sits up. He won't wake up. It's Letitia, chief stagehand of the orbiting human circus of the air. Please help. I told them I was your sister. I called, you know, before on uh, the telephone, but no, they tell me nothing, so I come. Oh, it's always like this. That's why I hate hospital. Letitia sits nervously by the janitor's bedside. She opens her mouth to speak, but hesitates. The show is closing. Letitia takes out the cigarette a doctor had lent her in the hall. It is Paris, after all. Walks to the far side of the room, and getting as far away from the janitor as she can, lights up. The polar bear here, he escapes the tower, he runs loose in Paris, he is going to the oyster bars and uh, along the Seine, anyway, the details don't matter, but... Uh... Yes, things are not going well with the show. In fact, Tonight's acts are all ones John Cameron had previously rejected. It seems he can get neither acts nor an audience to come. You know I had a dream that this would happen. I had a dream that uh, the show closed, and I had a dream that uh, you died. It was the same dream, in fact. And uh, now the show is closing, and you are... Uh, you are... Uh, Letitia extinguishes her cigarette and crosses to the janitor, and placing her head on his shoulder, takes him by the hand. I need you not to die. Letitia turns, colliding with the bedside table, causing a small radio to fall to the floor as she runs out of the room. On impact, the radio turns on. Exactly. 
schon gar nicht bei Schiff. You are listening to the Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation. And now, a Spot Announcement. Thank you, Spot. Sea of sleep, the radio reaches Julian. Like a light from above, he finds himself lifted closer and closer to the waking world and becomes suddenly aware that Coco, night watchman at the Eiffel Tower, is there with him. Coco, can you hear me? Coco? But the janitor's words remain beneath the surface of sleep and the old man cannot hear him. Coco! It reminds the janitor of the feeling when he was little, of trying to sing or speak underwater. It's a feeling he often has. But he does not have that feeling for long, because from the radio comes the sound that makes him happier than no other sound in the world. Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the orbiting human circus of the air. We start things off with the orchestral's version of Cole Porter's I'll Do Anything for Love But I Won't Do That, featuring the Mime Choir of Marais. As the robed choir of mimes open and close their mouths noiselessly, and the little orchestral plays its heart out, Backstage, we find Letitia with her stagehands Jacques and Pierre, obscured in the shadow of a 12-foot bowling pin. They had to give away free tickets to get people to come. Seriously, what the hell are we going to do? Two days' notice and we're out of a job? <laughs> Dispiritedly, Pierre leans back on the bowling pin. Pierre, ten times I tell you don't lean on the bowling pin. It is made to fall over. Calm down, Letitia. Look, here, look, here. I'm stepping away from it. It's okay. Host John Cameron comes rushing in. My jacket. Does anyone see where I put my jacket down? You're wearing it. I'm wearing it. Host John Cameron goes rushing out. That was the mime choir of the Marais. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't honestly think of a more beautiful way to begin our final evening than this very special demonstration you're about to hear by remote hookup. I give you Professor Edelweiss Fleur, broadcasting live from a ship where the sun meets the sea. Uh, I, I cannot hear clearly. There, there is a, there's a noise. That's our audience applauding you, Professor. Ah, yes. Uh, when, as children, we experiment with singing underwater, uh, other children cannot hear us. But, but the whales can. Uh, blessed with extraordinary hearing, the whale can hear children singing at distances of up to 10 nautical miles. And in many cases, answer, unbeknownst to us, with songs of their own. We will now demonstrate that whales, whose migration brings them closest to beaches frequented by children, begin to adopt tonal patterns found in human songs. Is this true? Yes. A migration of whales will pass momentarily. The sounds of these whales will travel back to the broadcast ballroom, where the orchestral stands ready to accompany any melodic pattern should one emerge. The orchestral stands prepared. And, and, and here they are. Meanwhile, in the janitor's hospital room, the janitor cannot contain himself. Coco. He knows this song. I sang it at a party when I was a kid. Strangely, at that exact moment, back at the broadcast ballroom, John Cameron becomes convinced that he hears someone singing along, a voice echoey and distant. My God, it can't be, but it is. He's okay? 
is an event. Julian. John Cameron rushes to the back of the stage, pulling the curtain aside to see the duct, and there he finds only Will. Back in the janitor's hospital room, the janitor continues to speak to his friend, completely unaware that the old man has already gone. Coco, remember I told you that I ran away to my great-grandfather's when I was a kid? In that song, there was a party at my great-grandfather's house the first night, and they were singing that song. It was like 4 a.m., it was like 4 in the morning, and they had this huge, huge dinner, and um, I was hiding because... Like, I thought if somebody saw me, they'd put me to bed, you know? And I was feeling really jealous because I... And it was like my great-grandfather forgot about me. And I, I was looking, and and, and, I, and my great-grandfather didn't have a shadow. And it was just so we weird, because everything else in the room had a shadow, and my great-grandpa did not have a shadow. And I looked back... And his shadow was a swan. It looked exactly like a swan. And then I looked away again, and I looked back, and his shadow was gone again. And then the next time I looked, his shadow was a train. He was moving things around on the table. He was, like, moving the serving dishes and the wine bottle and the wine glass and the lamp. And he was moving all these things around, and the whole time he was, like, leaning back and into his chair. So he didn't have the shadow because the, the chair was swallowing it up. And he was moving all these things around. And the whole time he's talking to the, all the other adults, he's the complete center of attention. And nobody has any idea that he's doing this. And then he leans forward. And his shadow makes a picture. And nobody knows except for me. He was doing it just for me. And I climbed out from behind the couch I crawled right into the center of his shadow. And I fell asleep. The whales, ladies and gentlemen. The orchestral. And now, behold, our stage transformed. A bowling alley of gigantic proportions. Two lanes, two sets of 12-foot pins and two cannons. This can only mean one thing, ladies and gentlemen. The world's two greatest aerialist oddities have challenged each other to a mammalian cannonball bowling contest. Ladies and gentlemen, Ernest the equestrian cannonball and Martha the bovine cannoness. The horse aims its cannon, lights its fuse and climbs inside. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the cow! The cow aims her cannon, lights her fuse, and climbs inside. But John's thoughts are elsewhere. I'm gonna die. And it's a split, ladies and gentlemen. And now our crew is hustling to reset the pins, ladies and gentlemen, as the horse lights his fuse, climbs inside. It's all over. Oh, it's a looper, ladies and gentlemen. But the horse picks up an extra four for a spare. Could have had a beach house. And now it's Martha climbing into the cannon, fuse burning down. There she goes. I'll be homeless. And it's a double, ladies and gentlemen. Martha in the lead. Oh, I'm hearing it now. That singing sounds like a ghost. And the horse sailing through the air. And he does it, ladies and gentlemen, a pure turkey from the horse, turkey horse. I'm feeling like a proud Thanksgiving turkey right now with a horse. What if the janitor dies? The janitor's hospital room. A dark, hulking presence suddenly blots out the light, its blackness devouring all in its midst, including sound. The shadow draws closer and closer at last, enfolding he and his bed, coming to him as it had to so many before, the young and old alike. He wonders, most of all, at the fact that he is not afraid. It reminds him suddenly of his first day at school. Everybody goes. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how to say goodbye. So it must be with our show. We don't want things to end, but they do. 
and how easy it is to love that which we know will not come back. And here's an act, ladies and gentlemen, that certainly will not. For our final feature presentation, the riveting memoir of one of our most beloved regular performers, you've all enjoyed his work, will now learn his extraordinary story. It's Yermak, the pie-eating Cossack. Hello, I am Yermak. Yermak, the pie-eating Cossack. It is we Cossacks who eat pie like no others. We who travel the barren, lifeless steps, longing for the maternal sweetness of raspberry, blueberry, pineapple, gooseberry, legonberry, banana cream, key lime. Also, there is savory pies. Backstage at the broadcast ballroom, huddled in consoling embrace are Letitia and John Cameron, Beside them, Jacques tries to hide the fact that he is crying while Pierre offers him his handkerchief. And as Yermak talks and One talks, I ate a pie with dog food. as slow as his story is, it is not slow enough for the amassed crowd backstage, for with each word he seems to count down the remaining minutes left in the life of the show. <sighs> this place is drafty. Earlier, the wind sound was so loud I thought someone was singing. You heard it too. He's haunting us. But what's this? In the distance, far from the light cast off the stage and approaching is... Wait a minute, it is a ghostly form. It, it's barely visible. As it approaches, an unearthly breathing can be heard whistling through the halls. What is that? Trailing behind it, a vast blackness that seems to devour all that it passes, making more and more of the backstage disappear as it draws nearer and nearer. Unafraid of anything, even Letitia takes a step back. This cannot be. John Cameron stands frozen like a deer in the headlights, and Jacques rises to his full height, his heart pounding. But this is just like my dream. I ain't been to confession in 14 years. It's drawing nearer now. I'm ready. Please. I'm not ready. One can begin to make out... Uh, bloody bandages, a hospital gown, his face. Jack, Letitia, everybody, it came for me. It followed me here. The janitor and that which follows him finally reached the light. Oh my God. It's the great recitating platypus of the North. I woke up and he was there. You're alive. If, if the platypus is there, Julia! you can make a wish and it'll come true. And I, I asked him to come here. Jock steps forward. Mr. Platypus, oh my God. Thank you for saving my mother when I was little. She she said you came to her. And, and when I was eight, I stopped believing in you. And I... John Cameron steps between Jock and the Platypus. Mr. Platypus, I know you only cure sick and infirm people, but we are show people. And in saying this, he puts a hand on the janitor's shoulder to include him in the statement. And our show is dying. I don't know why you came here, but Mr. Platypus, if you were to go on the air, you would save our show. Please. The giant platypus slowly bends forward and places its flipper on John Cameron's shoulder. John Cameron tears himself away and runs to the stage, only stopping on the way to unplug Yermak's feature presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have something for you now that has changed everything. And you're not going to believe it. I give you no less than the greatest broadcast event in the history of this medium. A being who up till now has only appeared in dreams and stories that we were told as children. Here, right now, waiting. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the great recitating platypus of the North. The platypus walks on stage. The platypus leans back, opens its mouth, and is about to speak. No, this is not, not now. Oh no! Julia! Julia! The entire ballroom disappears. The audience, the stage, Mr. Cameron, the microphones. All that remains is the janitor, not in blood-stained bandages but holding his bucket and mop in janitor's attire. 
he stands on an outer pathway of the Eiffel Tower, awakened from his daydream by Mr. Chenard, his boss. The janitor offers no excuses. Unlike Coco, Mr. Chenard is not the kind of man who can imagine a ballroom at the Eiffel Tower. No, the janitor simply stares, because directly behind his boss stands the great recitating platypus, as real as life itself, and he realizes the platypus has stayed with him upon awaking. And as his boss yells, he does not listen. The janitor is making a wish. The platypus disappears. The janitor begins to mop, and Mr. Chenard angrily walks off. Seeing Mr. Chenard is gone, the janitor stops mopping. He leans back and closes his eyes. Suddenly, there is a wooden stage beneath him. Around him, a grand ballroom with a red velvet curtain, and next to him is John Cameron, Letitia, Jacques, Francois, Pierre. And his wish has come true. But this is not what he has wished for. He wished for the audience he'd always kept with him to become real. And he does not know how, but he feels that you are with him, and he believes that you are real. Tune in next season, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right here, waiting for you. Julian, why don't you sing something? John Cameron nudges the janitor up to the microphone. Go ahead. The orchestral stands waiting. Come on, sing. The janitor, a blush on his face, opens his mouth and sings. Oh, here you are.
that's it for this year, ladies and gentlemen. This is John Cameron, broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the Orbiting Human Circus wishes you a good night. Hey, this is Eric Slider from the Orbiting Human Circus. We wanted to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for helping make our show possible. We are extra glad they are our sponsor because we here at the Orbiting Human Circus are just crazy about buying houses. In fact, I just picked up a sweet new number on the way to the studio today. Julian recently had to cut down on his house buying habit from three a day to just one because he was running out of bed sheets. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can all of you guys deal constantly with the slow, untrustworthy, convoluted, old-fashioned mortgage process? With Rocket Mortgage's transparent, trustworthy online process, you can securely share your financial info to get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. So even if your dream is just to have one true home of your own, skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online with Rocket Mortgage at quickenloans.com slash OHC. That's OHC for Orbiting Human Circus. Equal housing lender. Licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumeraccess.org number 3030. And thanks again to Blue Apron. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to make your own home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com ohc.